Over the next few videos, I'd like to cover sections 5.8 and 5.9 of Wessel's notes. Now, 5.8 is on spectral analysis, and that's based on the fact that any function can be described as a sum or superposition of individual periodic functions with different frequencies. Uh, to sort of start our discussion, I'll first cover um, an introduction of the concept along with some examples of, of the concept and why it's useful. The next section I'd like to cover some, uh, perhaps a review of periodic functions with some basic definitions as well as some key properties that will, will be used uh, in the analysis. And then I'll go into defining a discrete Fourier series and deriving where, where that comes from. And finally, this will lead in naturally into the discussion of a periodogram or discrete power spectrum, which basically describes how the amplitudes of the different periodic functions that make up the total function, how that amplitude changes uh, with period. It's a way of identifying any key frequencies uh, in your data sequence. So starting on with introduction and examples. Again, the basis for spectral or Fourier analysis um, is that any function can be described as a sum of periodic functions of different wavelengths, that is, if the sequence is a sequence in space, or any fun periodic functions of different periods, if it's a sequence in time. So my example here is um, a square wave. So this the yellow um, yellow curve is a an approximation to a square square wave, and the first component that makes up that square wave is a sine function with um, the wavelength of the whole data sequence, uh, going from x equals zero to two. Now the bottom plot shows what will turn into be turn out to be our periodogram or discrete power spectrum and it shows the amplitude of each of our periodic functions. In, case, in this case the first amplitude is a little over 1 as you can see here and it has a wave number which is 2 pi over lambda of 2 pi over 2. So uh, in other words it has a wave number of pi. So that's what this vertical bar is. Now let's consider another um, a higher uh, a wave with a shorter wavelength. This particular wave has a, a wavelength of a third of, of the original one. And when we add that function to the first, you can see that we're starting to get a function that starts to uh, better approximate our original square wave function. This adds another component to our periodogram at a, at a slightly smaller amplitude and greater wave number. So as we add successively higher frequency or or, or um, shorter wavelength signals in, you can see that the uh, resulting signal becomes a closer and closer approximation to the square wave. And as we're adding to the total function, we're also adding to our periodogram and we're adding successive sine functions of higher or shorter wavelength and smaller amplitude until eventually we get a function that looks very close to our original square wave function. So this illustrates the concept that any function can be described as a sum of periodic functions of different wavelengths. Now, another a use of this analysis will be illustrated in this example. So let's get this going. So the um, this shows the record of temperature from our last homework problem in a borehole, uh, and the temperature fluctuations res result are ca or they're caused by fluctuations in water temperature as the water is convecting in the ground uh, uh, at a given depth. Okay, so this is temperature as a function of time, 
measured at, at a given depth. And we did this in our last homework. We used this data set in our last homework assignment to see if there is any um, strong correlations between its rec this record and itself in an autocorrelation function. And, it, and we found that, in fact, there was a strong correlation if, if the record was shifted with itself over about 150 to 200 minutes, suggesting that there was some sort of periodicity in the record over that period of time. So the, if we take the do a periodogram of this same record, much like I showed you before, let's zoom in here a little bit. This is a this is a record of time. So the periodogram periodogram I'm showing you here has a frequency on the x-axis. And the biggest signal occurs at a frequency of zero. And that turns out to be the mean value of the temperature. The mean is a, a little over 0 0.035. And this shows the value of that mean amplitude. But as we go to um, actual fluctuations in temperature, you can see that there's a peak near about 0.005 a frequency of 0.005, and that corresponds to uh, 20, 200 minutes or so. So this shows that there's a dominant amplitude in, in the signal with a period of about 200 minutes. So this is a way of identifying some of the dominant periods in a time sequence. So that was our introduction and examples. Now let's get on to some definitions and properties of periodic functions. So you've probably learned about sines and cosines in high school uh, in trigonometry. And as you recall, if you have a unit circle, a circle of radius 1, and you draw a, a line in between the origin and to any point on the circle, uh, that's our radius vector then the horizontal component of that vector is cosine of the angle of the radius with the x-axis. So that's cosine theta. And then the y component is sine theta. So as we spin this radial arm around the unit circle, by and as we do so, we change theta, then, of course, the cosine function goes from 1 uh, down to minus 1 and back up to 1. And likewise, the sine function starts off at 0. It goes up to 1 and down to minus 1 and then back to 0. So we could describe a periodic function as um, y equals a cosine theta and that's an example, where A represents the amplitude of the cosine function. For the unit circle, that amplitude is 1. But for a general function, the amplitude could be uh, any number. Now, for an oscillation in time, In other words, another interpretation of this cosine function is it describes an oscilla oscillatory be behavior um, as a function of this horizontal axis. And in the first example, the horizontal axis was, of course, theta. But it could also be time, in which case theta would be described as omega times time where omega is our angular frequency, 2 pi, over our period. And we would have y is equal to a cosine omega t. For an oscillation in space, Our cosine, the horizontal axis on the above plot would be, for example, x representing space, and we would 
and theta is equal to k times x, where k is equal to 2 pi over the wavelength of the oscillation, and that's called our wave number. And y would be described as the amplitude time cos times cosine kx. Now, following up on the function of, of um, an oscillation in time, if omega is angular frequency, then the um, the frequency is just 1 over t, the period. So t is period. So these example periodic functions are, of course, co cosine functions. And they start off at, at the amplitude at t equals 0. But that's not necessarily a general case because uh, the what defines zero is is arbitrary, arbitrary, and the cycle could start at a later time. So a general periodic function is described, for example, as a function again with our amplitude of cosine. And I'll take an example in which it's an oscillation in space, cosine kx minus phi, where phi is a phase shift, or I should just the phase. It describes how far off uh, of x equals 0 that the oscillation begins. Now, this describes two free parameters for a given wave number so so this this is two parameters for a given wave number that um, we would for example, end up solving for when we're trying to de decompose an original signal into a superposition of these functions. And But you'll notice that the phase is non-linearly related to the basis function. It's, in, it's the argument in the cosine. So describing the general function in this way can be complicated. So it becomes more practical to write this general periodic function in a slightly different form. Using a trig trigonometric identity, which um, describes this phase shift instead of in terms of products of other periodic functions. So the first function is a cosine function, and it has an amplitude of little a, which is a times cosine phi. And the second function is a sine function, and it has an amplitude of a, or a times sine b. So the relation, so a, so in this form, a and B are now linear functions, or they're um, they're multiplied by the basis uh, 
uh, basis functions. So now we have a linear relationship between our two uh, independent, our two parameters describing the function. And going, showing the relationship between big A and our two new parameters. Big A is the square root of A squared plus B squared. And phi is simply the arctangent of B over A. Or tangent of phi is equal to B over A. So we're going to use this function, or this form, of a periodic function to, to describe the general periodic function. Now, any real, any true data sequence that we have, of course, has a finite number of measurements. And, and they're, they're taken at discrete points. Thus, this data sequence must be described as a sum of discrete periodic functions. So let's define big T as the duration of the whole record. This is our whole data record, the, the total duration of the whole record. So the first or fundamental frequency that we can resolve with this data set has a period of, of big T or frequency of 1 over t. And the fundamental angular frequency is 2 pi over t. And because this oscillation is starts and ends with a period of exactly t, it is also called a harmonic. So a harmonic function is a function that starts and ends at the beginning and end of the full record. Uh, it has a f um, an integer number of oscillations across that period. So the lowest uh, harmonic has a period equal to the length of the entire record. The second harmonic has a period of half the total record length. So this is our second harmonic. The third harmonic has a period of a third the total record length. And so on, all the way down to our n minus 2 harmonic. And sorry, yeah, this is our n divided by 2 harmonic.
So the Jth harmonic is described as, for example, y is equal to aj cosine omega j t. So, okay, I'll describe what the i's are in just a second. bj sine omega j t i. So this is the ith value of y at time ti for the jth harmonic, where j describes the frequency of this particular signal. Now t sub i, the time at the ith point, is equal to i times delta t. And here we're assuming that um, delta t is the sample interval the amount of time between subsequent samples and it's assumed to be constant. constant or uniform across the record. So the ith sample occurs at t sub i. And we can describe wj, the jth angular frequency, times ti, as equal to 2 pi t divided by j times i delta t, and that's equal to 2 pi j over t i delta t, and that's equal to 2 pi j over n delta t i, sorry, delta little t, delta t. n delta t is the length of the whole record because we have n samples separated by the space uh, d dt, delta t, and that's simply equal to 2 pi i all over n divided by j. So these are different ways of writing wjti in terms of the indices of each record and the total number in the record. So going back to our example of our square wave, and here I'm looking at the j equals 3 harmonic. So this is um, j equals the third harmonic, and I'm plotting dots at each point of at which we sampled our square wave. So the time interval between each dot is, of course, delta t. And this shows uh, y at each ith point of this particular harmonic. And again, the lowest frequency that we can describe by our record has a period of 1 over t. Our, our lowest frequency is our fundamental frequency. And the highest frequency resolve that we can resolve is described by our n over 2 harmonic. So let's write this big T out in terms of little delta t, which is, again, our sample interval. And you can see that the shortest period that we can resolve is has a period of twice our sample interval.
So let's look at what that shortest period it is in our decomposition of our uh, square wave. So this is this red line curve here represents the highest harmonic that we can resolve by this particular sampling. And you can see it zigzags between each uh, sample interval. Our sample interval here is about 0 0.07 or something like that. But you can see that the shortest wavelength or the shortest period we can resolve is is a period of two times the sample interval. This is a very crude representation of a cosine function that starts off at 1, goes to minus 1, and then back out over 1 over twice the sample interval. So that's an illustration of why our shortest period is 2 times delta t. It turns out that the highest frequency is our is called our Nyquist frequency. Just uh, describing some terminology that you'll see coming up in harmonic analysis. So it looks like I'm running out a little bit out of time for this particular video, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna stop here.